Hi everybody, um, welcome to uh, another Office Hours and this is our first Office Hours for 2020, uh, which is always very exciting. Um, I think this is also our third January, so we've kind of, we've been going for a while now, which is exciting. Um, we are tackling a very fun subject today, one that we know resonates with a lot of you um, and that we're really looking forward to picking apart and exploring, um, we're thinking about peer review. Uh, so I am Zoe from the Rebus community and I am joined as always by my lovely co-host Karen from the Open Textbook Network and our illustrious guests. And then we, Karen and I, are also stepping into the role of guest this time around, which is quite exciting. <laughs> um, a bit of a change for us in terms of format, uh, but this is a subject very close to both of our hearts, so we're keen to also be contributing. Um, as always, the format will be five minutes from each of us. Uh, followed by discussion, questions in the chat. You're welcome to unmute and, and speak um, for you, you, when you want to ask a question as well. Uh, and yeah, so for now I'll hand over to Karen to introduce our guests. Thank you. Thanks very much, Zoe. Uh, we're delighted to partner with the Rebus community on monthly office hours calls. And um, today we are going to hear from four of us, as Zoe said. We're gonna start with Dan Rudman. He is Associate Director for Community Outreach of Punctum Books, and he is sitting in for Eileen Joy today. And then after Dan, we will turn things over to Catherine Ahern. She is Head of Content for PubPub and Knowledge Futures Group. And then I'll say a few words, and then Zoe will say a few words, and then we will open things up um, and hear from all of you. So Dan, I'm gonna hand things over to you. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Dan Rudman. I am the Associate Director at Punctum Books. Uh, just to give a little bit of background about our press and our um, position when it comes to peer review, we are an open access press and um, not only do we publish our, our books open access, um, but we try to um, embody uh, the concepts of open access uh, in all of our processes. Um, and that extends, of course, to peer review. And when I say that, I think um, what I mean is that we are open to exploring a lot of different modes of peer review and governance uh, for our community. Uh, we don't, we are not just, we don't just have one standardized way uh, in which we enact peer review, but there are, there are a number. So just a, a very brief rundown. Um, we are a um, scholar-led press, so all of our directors are uh, PhDs in, in various fields, including myself. Um, and so when we're doing acquisitions, when we're editing, um, already you have the community um, aspect um, with, with the, the material that we're working with. Um, we also have a very involved editorial board that we've actually just revamped um, recently. You can, you can see that board on our website and we're they take a very active role uh, in acquisitions, in assessing work. Um, and uh, the third thing to mention is that we take a very, we take our titles on a very case by case basis. Uh, the nature of our press, uh, we publish uh, academic and what we call kind of para academic work. So for example, if we're publishing a piece of theory fiction uh, that requires a, a certain kind of review that is distinct from if uh, we're publishing a book that's uh, critical to somebody's uh, tenure file or a dissertation. Uh, and we make sure that uh, we take all of those specific conditions very seriously. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a brief rundown of our press and our, uh, our view on peer review. And I'm excited to kind of dig into that and, and learn more uh, about from y'all. So thank you. Thanks, Dan. And now over to you, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Catherine Ahern. I am the head of content at PubPub and the Knowledge Futures Group. And just for some context and for those who don't know, uh, PubPub is an open source publishing platform for open access content. And it's also part of the KFG, which is a fairly new not-for-profit consortium of academic, industry, advocacy organizations that is seeking to build support um, and really advocate for products to make knowledge open and just more accessible for everyone. Um, and I think, you know, I, I consider myself really lucky in that I often get to work with 
a really broad range of researchers, university publishers, journal editors, and others who are all kind of looking to plug into the existing scholarly comms ecosystem in different ways, including those who really just want to burn it all down and start from scratch. And so, you know, I often find myself, they're out there, <laughs> I often find myself, um, you know, gathering bits of perspectives, ideas, experiences from these different groups that really help inform the ways that we're building PubPub and how we can help our users to collaborate and iterate and really just communicate their research. Um, and so peer review is just one use case where, uh, at least in my opinion, things get really interesting. Um, and in a basic sense, I would say uh, peer review, you know, generally is our best attempt at communicating trust. Um, over time, that simple act of kind of providing a quality check um, has also been tied with a small number of processes for doing that correctly. Um, and I think that what's been, uh, what's become clear to me since I joined PubPub, you know, a little over two years ago, is that when we fail to take into account kind of what Dan was saying, when we fail to take into account the subject matter, the goals and the intended audiences of a publication, um, when we seek to put it through peer review, you know, we also kind of fail to fully support the work that has been done and we tend to undermine its potential value. Um, so you know, what, I'm, what I kind of mean by that is that there are just like so many learning opportunities that open up when you also open up peer review and the publishing process. Um, and so, for example, last year there was um, a book written by Lauren Klein and Catherine Diagnazio called Data Feminism. Um, and they put their manuscript on PubPub for open review. The final manuscript or the final book will be published by the MIT Press later this year. Um, but they, you know, asked to have an open peer review process and they were really great and specific about the kind of help they sought, the questions they still had. Um, and when they published their draft, they received hundreds of comments and annotations from readers, um, but they also responded to them and were able to extend that conversation um, in a way that they wouldn't have been able to do that otherwise. Um, and this is really, this is exciting for me. Um, because it, it kind of doubles down on the peer and peer review. And by doing that, it opens up the publishing process. It invites communities in at an earlier stage to the benefit and learning of that community, the authors and the improvement of that final piece of work. Um, and I should say like as a platform, we don't see it as our job to be prescriptive. Um, we're in the process of building an open source review management system within PubPub. Um, but we let communities define their terms and their processes however they'd like. Um, but we do think it's within our mandate to make sure that allowing for the redefinition and reconsideration of peer review is something that we support, is included in that spectrum of possibilities. Um, and so kind of getting back to my initial definition of peer review as a signal of trust, um, you know, we're, we're, we hope that like building out open tools for open processes can help bring about a sense of flexibility, experimentation, um, maybe even a redefinition of peer review and other processes so that they're better aligned with the works themselves that they're meant to improve. Um, and we've seen journals like the Journal of Design Science, which is also on PubPub, change their peer review policy on an issue by issue basis just to better match the content. Um, recently, a new journal called Reviews in Digital Humanities uh, launched on PubPub and it not only took on the task of peer reviewing DH projects, um, but it's also creating a catalog of them. And I think this is great because in a sense, in just doing that, it's also kind of communicating a level of trust and quality about projects just through the act of including them in this list. Um, this journal and another kind of new journal called the Harvard Data Science Review, um, they're just by existing, they're, they're attempting to define and create trust and community around newer fields. Um, and in a sense, like peer reviewing whole new swaths of scholarly inquiry, methodology, just by their existence. So kind of expanding what that notion even means is also something that I'm really interested in. Um, so I'll kind of end there, you know, PubPub, we're trying to work through a bottom-up process and, um, 
and trying to support this kind of experimentation and flexibility. And I'm really curious to see what other people's experiences are and, and um, if they have any input to help us do that better. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. I will echo both what you and Dan have said so far in terms of um, listening to your members, allowing for flexibility, and um, just uh, allowing to burn, burn things down and see what we build in its stead. So um, both of you spoke pretty broadly about different uh, scholarly publishing, and I'm going to zero in a little bit on open textbooks since um, I'm responsible for managing the open textbook library as well as developing publishing programs for OTN members. Um, but before I get really specific about textbooks, um, or maybe to frame, to frame the conversation, I think it's really important to step back and um, question you know, where textbooks sort of fit in on the spectrum of scholarly publications. Do we think this is um, you know, a, a product of inquiry or argument, or is it perhaps more a survey of what's out there? I think that's a really interesting question um, for all of us to examine together. Um, for a little bit of background, as I think many of you know, books in the Open Textbook Library come from a wide variety of sources. They might come from an independent author, they might come from a library publishing program, they might come from a grant funded program like, like OpenStax. So there's really a lot of diverse models um, that are uh, behind the growing number of open textbooks that are in the OTL now, we're approaching 700. And I think the diversity of sources is really important and really valuable for our community. And that keeping flexibility in our publishing model is also really important. Um, so, you know, I've heard from people who do faculty workshops that are based around the open textbook library. You know, gosh, faculty really want to know what kind of peer review went on for these textbooks, you know, what was involved, what kind of rigor was there. Um, and so, you know, we looked at the possibility of trying to unearth uh, exactly what may have happened during the publication process for open textbooks that are in the library. And as you can imagine, uh, that that's a huge undertaking that may or may not be um, possible. But um, I think there's another question about systematizing peer review, whether it's by some kind of um, symbol or explanation that really might be a burden for more fledging, fledgling uh, publishing programs that you know, are barely kind of eking out open textbooks with limited staff, limited funding, and then to sort of say, hey, we also want you to do this particular type of peer review so that you can be legit, um, can really be difficult. And it doesn't take into account the fact that openly licensed textbooks, of course, um, allow for and invite there to be lots of revision for students to be involved in, um, in reviewing the work and seeing what works for them and what doesn't or contributing content. I also think just stepping back and um, thinking about commercial textbooks, their peer review process is not exactly transparent either. Um, usually many people um, who I've talked to have said, you know, it is part of the, the marketing of the textbook. You invite, you know, your colleagues to review it. They might be blurbed on the book and then they have um, a more of a stake in that book's success or involved in its marketing down the road. Um, so I'm just cautious about um, favoring larger publishers that have more resources. I'm cautious about holding open textbooks to a higher standard than commercially produced textbooks. And um, I want to kind of allow for this diversity in, in models to flourish. And so I think with that, um, I will turn things over to Zoe. Thank you so much, Karen, um, and to Dan and Catherine as well. Uh, this is really, really wonderful to hear about the, the different work that you're doing and the approach you take. Um, I'll speak kind of both to our work at Rebus, but also how I think about these things a bit more generally from the perspective of open publishing. Um, and I think the, what I come back to often, and, and if you've, you've talked to me at conferences, I've probably said this to you many times, um, we're in the process of building a new system of publishing with open publishing, or at least we have an opportunity to do so. And that opportunity means that we can also do things differently and improve on them in, in ways that 
uh, align more with our values, with our goals, um, and what we're actually trying to achieve with this publishing system. Uh, it can be kind of invisible at times. Um, it's so established and, and expected that things happen the way they do because they always have. Uh, but we really have space here to tear it apart a bit. Um, and you know, from our perspective at, at, at Rebus, what we think about is how we can do things better in terms of making them more inclusive, um, more responsive to a wider range of needs, and more contextual. Uh, so my, my typical list of things to do is we get to pick up whatever was there before, look at it, decide if we want to keep it, decide if we want to keep bits of it, or if we want to throw it away. All of those options are, are open to us as we make these decisions. So within the context of peer review, um, one thing that we've built into our process, so what we've developed is a, a collaborative model for open textbook publishing that is both replicable but also very flexible and adaptable. All of that's available um, in, in our guides. So we've kind of we've gone through the process of doing hands-on peer review and then tried to document it in a way that other people can then use it. Um, and the critical question that we kind of ask is, what is peer review for? What is peer review for on any given project? Um, and traditional peer review structures have been, and I think Catherine, you spoke very well to this, about uh, being markers of quality um, and, and trust, I think, takes that in a really nice direction. Um, but they've been a mark of quality for only certain kinds of knowledge and knowing. The systems that have emerged have come from specific contexts dedicated to specific purposes that don't necessarily meet the needs of what we're working with right now and what we want to achieve. Um, so there are, there's a lot built into the systems that if we just replicate them, we'll continue to only recognize certain kinds of knowledge certain, um, as I said, ways of knowing is, is a phrase I come back to a lot. Uh, and so I kind of want to, want to challenge that a little bit. And there are at least two ways in which I think we can chat about that a bit today. Um, there are many, many more. Um, one is the ways in which we can challenge who is considered a peer and who is considered an expert. Uh, so a couple of examples of where you might want to reflect on that is if a work is really localized or contextual, um, and being reviewed by somebody who has academic knowledge of the field, but no lived experience of it, you're going to get a very different result in terms of what they can contribute to the work itself. Uh, the the um, example that often comes up with that is traditional knowledge within indigenous communities. There are things that are known um, within certain cultures or communities that aren't citable. So not being able to, to necessarily reference it in the way that, that you may uh, expect out of a traditional scholarly text or, or um, educational resource can, um, can maybe not fit with a rubric of peer review that's been provided. And, and that has, we have to open up space there to think about what that might mean, how else we can look at that and think about how to demonstrate the quality of it or its, its value. Um, and another way that we can think about that is thinking about who peers are and thinking if we can include makers and people with applied knowledge. Uh, so as I was chatting about this with Lee earlier, we have a friend whose research is uh, in the field of fermentation. So she is currently in Japan working in a soy sauce factory and she's worked in natural sake breweries and the scholarly production that, that, uh, you know, that comes out of her research um, you know, we were talking about how there's as much space for an expert in, in making soy sauce to be able to contribute value back into that work and, and analyze it from the place of an expert and think about how they can support enriching those materials. So who is a peer and, and, and who are the people who are involved in these processes is, is really critical for us to think about and make more space for. Um, working as we do very hands-on with a lot of projects, we also have to be practical. Um, and the, uh, going back to that question that we have asked of everybody we've worked with on peer review and that we encourage everybody to ask who's embarking on it, is what do you want to achieve with peer review? Are you looking for that traditional marker of quality where you can put a peer review statement in the back of your open textbook that says this was double blind reviewed? Maybe you want to undertake a different kind of feedback process and those aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, but maybe you want to give space for people to contribute more in-depth feedback and, and go through more rounds of revision. Again, kind of speaking to, I think, um, similar to what Catherine mentioned of being in conversation with your reviewers uh, can, can offer a different kind of experience of being an author, being peer reviewed. Uh, and those priorities, as you think about them and decide them, will shape the process differently. 
um, from, from maybe what, you know, say, for example, an open textbook uh, author who's been through traditional journal review processes more often um, and coming to open, open education may have space to think about whether that does apply, whether they can do things differently. Um, and there's also, from that practical sense, the idea that you, a, lot of, a lot of faculty authors need to work within systems that expect certain things. Uh, you know, the, the tenure uh, and promotion guidelines, the importance of, of peer-reviewed articles and, and publications, those are still things that are important and that we need to work with. Uh, in any kind of systems transformation, it isn't one stops and then the other begins. There's overlap and we need to be encouraging and supportive of people who are trying to navigate that overlap so they can both uh, you know, achieve what they need to to move forward in terms of say, uh, career progression and also engage differently in, in what they want to, um, to get out of the process of, of undertaking peer review on their work. And I would argue that also goes a lot for peer reviewers themselves too. There's a nice other side to this. Um, so a couple of the ways we encourage people to do that is to work with an expanded group of reviewers um, and, and to really think about who, who should be the expert voices there. And that includes uh, having parallel processes for classroom review and really bringing students into the process in a very uh, dedicated way. And um, very conveniently, our next office hour session is going to be on classroom review. <laughs> so I'm both teeing that up and that's also, I, I can dig into that a little more if people are interested, but I wanted to kind of um, bring that in too as another way of of understanding if you know if your purpose is to really enrich and strengthen um, the content that you're producing and sharing with people, the kinds of voices that come into it should absolutely include students because they're ultimately the audience for it. Uh, you are, yes, you know, needing to appeal to people who are adopting a text, which is where those markers of quality, markers of peer review are important, um, but they are choosing it in order to apply in their classrooms. And so I think there's a, a case that you too have a responsibility to those students to, to put as much work into, into shaping the text for them as you can. Um, and I will wrap up shortly, but I think I'll, I'll echo what's been said a couple of times um, that I think we... We need to get comfortable with being less strict in our frameworks, um, focus on our desired outcomes, what we really want to achieve, and undertake all of these processes critically. Um, so not just reproducing or, or um, uh, reproducing things the, the same way that they've always been done. And even if you are in a position where you need to do that, reflecting on that process, thinking about why you've had to do it, how you would do it differently if you had the opportunity to, and then finding those opportunities. Um, and I think, too, a lot of this comes back to working contextually and understanding, you know, the case-by-case the -case basis uh, and, and thinking about what's appropriate in any given, um, given time or space or, or group of people, rather than trying to maintain a, a strict kind of high-level structure that everybody must conform to. Um, and there is some discomfort in that, I think, when people are very used to working within those systems. Um, and that's also a really fun opportunity. So yeah, let's get comfortable with a bit of discomfort around these things. And hopefully that's a nice seek into maybe some questions um, or if, you know, if people are reacting to this and, and um, however you are, or if you have more to share and build on, we'd really love to open it up and hear from everybody. Thank you. Thanks Zoe. So to echo what she just said, we are turning things things over to you for your comments. Feel free to unmute to ask a question or make a comment or put it in the chat. There is one question in chat already and that is for Catherine. Um, Daniela says, thanks for presenting PubPub as a platform for open peer review. I'm curious how you find your reviewers and how you define expertise. Um, yeah, good question and thanks for kind of prompting me to clarify. So, PubHub is a platform where uh, publishing communities can create their own spaces. So when I mentioned earlier that, you know, we're not prescriptive, we allow those publishing communities to manage their own spaces however they'd like. So we don't actually manage peer review processes for the publishers or research groups um, or journals that use the platform. Um, we just allow them to um, have the infrastructure to support whatever process they want to use. Um, so we're, you know, we're kind of process agnostic and, um, you know, while we'll sometimes provide some best practices and suggestions, uh, we leave it up to the, um, the groups to, to decide for themselves and to select their own peer reviewers. Um, and just to clarify, because I also see that the link to the peer review transparency project was shared on the thread. 
Um, they're a great group that has used PubPub to publish their own work, um, but they're not necessarily a PubPub project. They're aligned in a lot of the things that we that we are interested in and want to support. Um, and I think, you know, to me, the, the clarification between open review and transparent review is important because you can have a closed review system and be transparent about how it was done and say, this was double blind and it went through three different you know, iterations and it took this long. And that to me is a good amount of transparency, but it's not open review. And so the PRT you know, is working to create badges that will allow people to be transparent about what kind of review process they engaged with and applied to a piece of work without it necessarily needing it to be open review. Thanks, Catherine, and thanks for explaining the link I sent. I was like, is this right? Is this? <laughs> no, it's not <laughs> wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but feel free to share any links you think would be helpful um, in the chat. So Lee said that uh, she would also like to hear everyone respond to Daniela's question. So um, I'll just say much like Catherine, we leave it up to our members of the Open Textbook Network, how to publish, how to manage peer review. And the same is true in the Open Textbook Library. Um, we do not ask, you know, how is this peer reviewed when we evaluate a textbook and consider adding it to the library. Um, we have four other criteria, but peer review is not one of them. And then, of course, we do have a, um, a more informal peer review process after publication, and you can see those reviews associated with any book record in the Open Textbook Library, but by no means is it a rigorous peer review. It's more um, aligned with the spirit of the Open Textbook Workshop, which is, hey faculty, you know, this option exists for you. Would you consider taking a look? Thanks for taking a look. What do you see? You know, what do you think this worked for you? So Dan, I'll, I'll maybe hand things to you uh, to answer Daniela's question. Absolutely. Um, so as a scholar-led press, um, we're fortunate in that we're very participatory in the networks uh, of our peers. So um, we're able to, through, through our own expertise, uh, reach out to reviewers who are in particular fields, um, both within and outside of the institution. Um, we're we're uh, very cognizant of the, the fact that the institution um, provides a certain amount of expertise, but there are a lot of people with expertise that are that are outside of the university. Um, and then again, our editorial board assists us not only in uh, the review process themselves, but in recommending people because our, our review board uh, has such a, a breadth and depth of expertise. We're able to utilize that to uh, to seek out peer reviewers. And um, I will say that as an open access press, uh, we also see um, peer review and governance uh, handled a different way by virtue of the fact that uh, our authors and in our context, people know that this is uh, going to be made available to everyone. Um, and so I think when your audience is a little bit more mysterious, when you're not writing a text that's for a small group of, of insiders in the field, um, that's another, um, another system of uh, ensuring uh, a certain amount of quality and a certain amount of care taken, taken in, in your writing. So, um, so yeah, these are all the ways in which we are really actively working to ensure uh, a certain level of authority and quality, uh, but in recognizing that that's often a very horizontal structure. Uh, there's a, there's a, there are a lot of different avenues to find uh, that sort of, I mean, as Zoe and Catherine have mentioned as well. But, so yeah, that's our take. I really like that um, point that by nature of writing an open text, you, you can approach it differently in, in terms of the actual writing itself too. And I, I, I um, yeah, that, that's really sparked something with me. And I think that um, one of the ways in which we talk about that with authors is thinking of downstream users. Um, so within open education in particular, remixability and adapting texts is a huge part of, of what we encourage people to, to set up for um, when they are creating new text. And that can sometimes be something that's a, uh, a, little, a little new or different. And I've just got this idea in my head now, but I'm like, well, what if somebody reviewed it for that? What if somebody looked at it through the lens of, what if I'm going to adapt this text? How is it meeting those kind of needs? 
um, as, as you look forward. And, and those adaptations can be from, you know, a, a really hefty rewrite, a combination of many texts through to, I just want to localize my examples. Um, and, and so there are ways in which you can set up to do that, uh, that can be very interesting. It's a fun thought I'm going to put on a post-it note. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Uh, and actually then, uh, Daniela, I'll respond to your question as well. We follow mu uh, much the model um, that, that Catherine described where it's up to the projects who are um, working with our, uh, within our community system, whatever you'd like to call it. Uh, and, and there's a lot of self-determination there. Um, what we, again, try to do is prompt them to think about what their, their goals are, use that to shape the process. And I like that you introduced that, um, that clear distinction between open and transparent, uh, Catherine, because I think there are, there are options to do both of those um, within the processes we've developed. I think it probably most projects we've worked with have veered towards the transparency rather than the openness. Some do use hypothesis uh, as, as an open web annotation um, option to, to undertake the review. So the reviews stay there and the engagement is there for people to see. Um, I think a lot of others veer towards the actual review phase taking place um, within, say, Google Doc, but then taking the time to write a peer review statement where they detail the process that they went through, who was involved if it's not an anonymous review. Um, so I think that's a really important distinction to acknowledge. Another thing that um, I was thinking of when you were speaking, Zoe, um, I was in a meeting with our development team not too long ago, and we were talking about this peer review system that we're building out. We were also talking about um, making um, it easier for classrooms to use PubPub and have spaces for, you know, gated conversation where, um, you know, teachers could seed questions or prompts for students and they can respond to them and it can you know have some protection from the public <laughs> um, and it was funny because we were actually talking about what those workflows look like and I was like well that's kind of like another kind of review like they're they're not that different right you want to create a space for a, a group however you want to define it to do a thing and when a student is engaging with a text they're kind of giving their opinion and, and writing their notes and annotations and you know the, the functions aren't that different um, you know, as, in, in terms of like what you're building out for a tool for, for technology. So um, kind of, you know, I was excited to see that you guys are going to have another office hours on classroom review because I definitely want to join that and kind of learn more about that because it wasn't until recently that we kind of realized that the actual act, you know, the way that we're thinking about review and the tools um, are probably a lot more similar than we would have thought. Absolutely. I, yeah, I would love to, to have you there and, and responding to that. Um, yeah, it, it, is, it is more similar than not in a lot of ways. Um, and it goes to that idea of, of the positioning of who is the expert. Um, and, and, you know, when you are working with students, I think it's always really important to have options for some measure of, of privacy that, um, you know, a lot of, and this is things I've learned from great minds in open pedagogy, it's about self-determination and choice and informed choice about how they participate in these kinds of things. Um, but the, the amount of value that can come into a project from having those voices in really early on um, is immeasurable. So, um, Catherine, we actually had a session two years ago on beta testing open textbooks, which is pretty similar. Um, so I'm just going to put a link in the chat um, from that conversation. Um, but I, sorry, yep. Catherine, remind me, I'd like to make a little note. I think actually um, that we, so as, as Rebus, we've been reflecting on that term beta testing and we now actually have moved a bit more to use a classroom review because it's a bit more accessible for people. I think sometimes beta testing could sound like, well, what is that? But classroom review is a little more immediately graspable. So at least in the way that we approach those processes, they, they aren't, there isn't a lot different. But in the time since we did that session, we've changed our language a little bit just to kind of So um, it's pretty quiet in the chat, and I'm just going to uh, encourage any of you to go ahead and post something in the chat or unmute. Um, I know that there are many library publishers in this call. There's some people who work at university presses in this call, and so we are really interested in hearing your thoughts as well and having a discussion. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a question either. It can, we welcome comments. Um, so while you get those ready, 
Uh, Zoe, can you say more about why authors would choose open peer review? This is uh, a prompt from Lee. Absolutely, um, and I'm really interested in hearing uh, Catherine and Dan respond to this too. Um, I think what open peer review does, at least in, in the experience of what we've seen with it, is that it, is, it expands the opportunity. Um, and it's part of the, the magic of open and also something that sometimes people take a bit of time to, to get comfortable with is you don't know who's out there who's interested in your work. Um, and, and so I think there's a measure of just opening up an opportunity for, for voices that you didn't know wanted to contribute to contribute, um, which can be really exciting. And we've seen the, the power of that in a bunch of different ways. And, and one of my favorite examples isn't related to peer review, but just the existence of a, of, um, you know, a work in progress being made public. Someone responded within half an hour to our announcements saying, I want to translate this into Spanish and I want to use it in my work in Chile. So they're kind of, you know, <laughs> it's just an excitement factor. Um, but as I say, that also can introduce a bit of, uh, you know, concern about, well, then anybody could respond. And, and you know, the internet is quite rightly uh, considered a, a scary place. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think that of, of us here, we have the most experience with that. Um, and so I'd really like to, to hand over to Dan or Catherine to respond to that too. Um. Sure, I can, I can start a little bit about, um, about our approach and our position at the press. Um, I think, Zoe, what she said is, is absolutely right on. Um, there's a danger in not being open that we um, are siloing our work and uh, we certainly want um, everyone, you know, whether or not they have different research interests or they're in a different kind of field, um, the, the work we're doing really crosses over in, in uh, so many different ways. Um, so we want that opportunity to be available to people. Um, but also, I, I should say that as far as, um, as open review, often our authors see uh, ethical implications. Um, having blind review uh, is sometimes used for, for conversations that are frankly not as productive in producing uh, really uh, wonderful scholarship, but also uh, you know, we're, we're building through a system that has for a very long time relied on uh, labor that's not recognized and not remunerated. Um, not, and we are really cognizant of that and we don't have necessarily a, sol a solution just yet, and, but we're working toward, uh, toward remedying that. That's, that's a major concern of ours. Thanks. Yeah, um, I obviously agree with everything that's been said. In our experience, um, observing different types of open peer review, um, it's, you know, to me, there's almost a humility in, in engaging in an open review and, and kind of saying that, you know, I'm writing this and I've worked really hard on this monograph, but what am I missing? How can this be better? How can I bring in voices and perspectives that I might be blind to and not realize it and and opening up that door or many doors and you know engaging with ideas that you know may not have been part of your long you know reading list or resources list when you were putting together your manuscript to begin with so it's a way you know of being a little bit more um, of just kind of making sure you've, you've kind of covered all your bases um, I've also seen that it's a nice way of creating community and interest in a work very early on. So there was a little bit of, of a worry that by engaging with open review, say for data feminism, that um, you know, people wouldn't be interested in buying the book later or that it would be considered old news when it finally came out. But we're actually finding that the opposite was true, that people then felt like they had a stake in this book, that they read it, they gave feedback, they got excited about it, they started chatting. And now people like cannot wait for this final manuscript to come out. And it's kind of a, a publishing house of marketing like dream, right? Where you have this organic, um, inclusive conversation and energy around a title because you actually invited people in earlier. So, um, you know, it seems like kind of everyone wins in that, in that way. Um, I'm sure there are lots of other reasons why people engage in open peer review, but that's been, you know, some of the, the highlights I've witnessed just jump up. 
Yeah, that last one is so, so important in open education. Uh, you know, the, that's our, you know, our entire approach is, is how can you from day one, from day zero, be building the community around your book because it makes it stronger content and because it makes, it gives it longevity. If you have people, you know, invested in this text over time, um, it's, you know, it's better for the teams who are at the core of the creation. It's better for people to know what's coming down the pipeline so they can be used in their classrooms. And it's better for the book to exist long into the future because people are invested in, and connected and working on it together in these really exciting ways. So I love that. It's really exciting. And, and then people see themselves, not just in the process, but in the work. Uh -huh. and, you know, it's just, it's more effective as a, as a piece of scholarship and, you know, just the process is also so much better um, geared toward learning. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm also, I'm going to drop an example in the chat of, um, from Erin Rose Glass, who's done social dis. So her dissertation was um, a really incredible project of, of open review and, and what's grown from that and her, she speaks to her experience about it really beautifully. And so I've dropped in one link and I'll, I'll look for a couple of others to, um, to share of, of her experience with that. So that is kind of almost a nice straddle between the, you know, the educational materials and the um, and scholarly outputs in the journal and monograph context of, of still, you know, uh, uh, an educational pursuit as part of her, I think it was her PhD. Um, so Jeremy is bringing us back, bringing us back to some hardcore, hard cold realities of uh, tenure and promotion and the systems in which we find ourselves. So um, he is asking for thoughts on how we get these new great models recognized by university administration, scholarly societies, and stodgy academics. Amy tacked onto that, but Amy, I'm still not getting the myth busting. So if you want to unmute and, and um, say more about what you're trying to get at there, that would be helpful. Oh, geez. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm going to be more articulate on the microphone. Um, <laughs> um, well, I think Jeremy may have said it better, but like, are there, are there things that seem like immovable objects that you run up against, but that are actually maybe not totally true and like what are some of the words that you use to like dispel those myths does that help yeah i think so thank you amy um i think i can speak to that a, a little bit um i think that a lot of that is tied to a, a larger uh wave of skepticism around open access more generally um and this was something Punkton Books has, has been around since 2011 uh, that, that we encountered much more frequently, um, you know, nearly a decade ago. But I think more recently, there has been a, a culture change among academics um, as more uh, ECRs voices are being heard, uh, in particular early career researchers are um, taking a part in their scholarly societies and having more active roles in, in departments. Uh, we do see, I think, just as, as a result of a long grind of, of doing this work that, um, that there's a lot of proof that uh, open access publishing models, open access review has, has produced meaningful scholarship and meaningful community around, around scholarship. So, it's certainly been just a very long process of uh, building a broad coalition of, of people to support us and to support this uh, sort of model. So we're part of a, a larger consortium of independent academic uh, open access presses um, called Scholar Led. And that is, we're based in the US, um, but we have partners in, in Europe and the UK um, who are engaged in similar work. and. You know, there's been major movement with things like Plan S uh, to move the needle on uh, perceptions of open access more generally. So I'm very hopeful, and I think you know we've certainly seen in the last few years um, a, a major change. And of course, it's still it's still an uphill uh, battle, but um, we certainly see a lot uh, shifting as far as perception perceptions of academic of, of open review and open publishing. So. 
Yeah, I am. Um, this is one of my favorite rants. And I wish like given how often I'm so angry about this or how often all of our conversations come back to the question of tenure and promotion practices, um, I'd be more fluent in talking about it, but <laughs> I'm not. It's just, you know, so much and so much of what drives decisions around how we conduct research and publish is around promotion. And you can't blame people for that. Um, it's just it's it, it's career moves really um at the end of the day and um i was i was like brainstorming ways of how to fix this about six months ago and um you know i was like well why don't we like give universities like open scores <laughs> and you know and i was reminded that and at first this felt really daunting but i was reminded that oftentimes the tenure and promotion policies or actually i think all the time they're department by department, which means that if you really wanted to, uh, you know, impact, influence change, you'd have to lobby every department within every university and it just would be this slog. Um, but I've come to think of that actually as a benefit because different disciplines are much more open to open access and open practices than others are. And I think that it's nice to think of those as like building blocks for increasing engagement and popularity and trust and legitimacy in in this way of of conducting work as as not the only way but another legitimate way of of um publishing and and um reviewing and um i kind of like to say that in my opinion um it's kind of like the philosophy around getting more people to vote i've said this before but like someone's more likely to vote if they if they know or even just think that their neighbors are also doing it. <laughs> and I think that's actually kind of true with scholars because, you know, many of them are pretty, um, you know, competitive and uh, it's it's more of a, a slow cultural change, which is always slower to to take hold than um, than other types of change. So I think just by starting with those groups that are more accustomed and more naturally open to open access. Um, we can actually start start there and, and, and have a good amount of success over time. I like that. And I, I, I want to hear another version of that, right? If you got it in, yeah. <laughs> we have more time. <laughs> um, I, on the tenure and promotion, I, I um, wanted to point out uh, that, and again, one of our previous office hours, Mark Gopsel, is somebody who um, used his open textbook as a pillar of his application, uh, and he did receive tenure. Um, and the way that we worked through that with him, we, at, at that point, we were working quite closely with him, was to learn how to put the process into language that was understood by the people who'd be reading it. Um, who maybe didn't have the understanding of open practices. Uh, and so, you know, I've, I've mentioned the peer review statement a few times. That is a really multi-purpose thing that you can include in your open textbook to make clear what has been done. And I think there are ways in which you can, um, you know, phrase that and, and choose to, to surface certain things or emphasize certain things that can be useful um, when you're using it as, as part of um, the, uh, you know, TMP as, as the example. Uh, and he too, I think, got a letter of support from us, if I'm remembering correctly. So if there's someone in a kind of a, a publisher role or a granting role or, or somebody with a bit of cachet that you think can also build in be there to support. I think that, you know, this is obviously talking at the faculty level. Those are the kinds of things that can work. Um, and then Karen, I'm really interested in going back to what you said initially about that, you know, comparing it to, uh, you know, commercial publisher practices. Um, I, I, I'm interested in how those conversations go for you. And I think there is, I want to say it was maybe Matt DiCarlo, I can't remember quite, but somebody tweeted out that they've been asked how someone would know that an open textbook was you know, quality, and his response was just, we'll read it. <laughs> Which I really enjoyed. Um, and it's like, you know, and, and, and the follow-up to that is, well, how would you know that a commercial publisher was? Um, and I, I won't go on this any further, but it's something I come back to a lot is that in open education, we don't have the same acquisitions role that you do in traditional presses. So, you know, what you were speaking to, Dan, there's not the same kind of acquisitions process that a lot of people do look to as another marker of quality. And so peer review, I think, then gains even more importance um, as, as building up that, that trust, as Catherine has spoken to. Uh, and Karen, yeah, what, what are those conversations look like? Well, there are many people on this call who can, who can speak to those conversations firsthand. I know that in our trainings, uh, we have a certain uh, Greek chorus of, it depends. 
So if a faculty member were to say, you know, what's in the open textbook library? Are the books any good? We would say, it depends, you know, <laughs> it's up to you to decide as the subject area experts. So, you know, there's no way for us, we're not a publisher. We're, our, our role with the open textbook library is really to try and be a one-stop comprehensive place that faculty can go and browse open textbooks that meet the four criteria in a, in a simplified way. Um, we've got one search bar um, and we just want it to be immediately apparent, you know, here's what's on offer, here's where it came from, and now you decide if it could work for you. And if the book has been reviewed before by, you know, colleagues in that subject area, it'll, it'll appear there with the record and they can see, you know, in, uh, for better, for worse, on a star system, uh, how that book has been perceived um, in, I think, about a dozen different areas ranging from, you know, organization to thoroughness. Um, and that metric was um, adapted from BC campus, or maybe not even adapted, maybe we just use the exact same one. Um, Lori might be able to, to say she's in this call too. So that's how we approach it. Um, we're, you know, in keeping of the theme, the talking point themes today, you know, we really are not here to say like, here's the right way to do it, or we can't wait to replicate the established models. Um, we're really just saying, you know, you as a faculty member are going to evaluate the materials you want to use in your course. And so here's just one thing that you could choose to evaluate. Here's what we think the benefits are. But of course, this is totally your call. Um, and so that's how, that's how we approach those conversations. Other questions or comments for us? We haven't really given much of a pause. So now we can have our awkward pause moment. Daniela. Yeah, I feel I just tried to because I already asked a question, but I'm just going to try. <laughs> I'm just going to kind of follow up on one. So um, thank you for organizing this. I'm, I'm Daniela Saleri. I'm the uh, project director of peer review and peer review is a project that has been trying to uh, bring more diversity to peer review via um, including more uh, people in the process uh, of uh, the peer review preference. And it's, I'm very interested in learning also more about the classroom um, uh, engagement with uh, peer review of textbook. Because that's kind of like how peer review was actually born when I was a student and wanted to bring more awareness around preprints and trying to introduce the review of preprints into journal clubs and, and uh, students' uh, classes. Uh, and then we kind of kind of evolved towards like this bigger, uh, humongous goal. Uh, but what we are trying to do, and um, it was also great to hear more about what Papab is doing. Uh, definitely to keep in touch. But uh, my one of my quest my question is like so we have been because we open up basically anyone who Norkid ID can do peer review on pre review and the outbreak science now uh, uh, pre, pre pre review uh, platform we we brought up. A lot of people are like, how do you again? How do you know that this, that I should trust this review? How do you know that I should trust this people this this expert or whoever does it? Um, and it, uh, we pushed back a lot on bringing, um, you know, any badge that can identify re uh, reviewers, not only for, we have a pseudonymity system, but even those that identify themselves with their name, because we actually want to go against this idea that a good review is related to a person who has, you know, 10 years of, you know, experience and has had a PhD at Harvard, all of that. So like kind of break down those existing metrics of expertise. And it is so incredibly hard. Um, and that doesn't mean that we don't, we don't need to continue doing it, but by having more and more conversations with um, uh, organizations that are uh, trying to raise, raise the voices of uh, African um, scientists, for instance, the African Science Initiative, we're hearing more and more like how we really need to get at this from like an anti-colonial um, kind of uh, point of view. We're like really combating this idea that Af some most of researchers Africans themselves tend, seem to have it's like well they they have been trained to not think like they are actually experts so how do you if you have any ideas of like what are if we need to bring because to attach something to tr to be trusted we think we need maybe we need short text so shortcuts perhaps or maybe not but like what are new metrics that we can think of if we do them need them at all to actually <laughs> level up this inequity and and kind of prevent the system to be recreated in kind of this space of open kind of like what Zoe said. So that was a little bit of all over the place. Uh, I didn't prepare this question, but 
I wanted to hear more uh, from everybody, not just from the panel, if, if anyone has expertise uh, about this topic. Thank you. Thanks, Daniela. I will uh, invite Dan or Catherine to comment since we have but a mere two moments. Two moments equals two minutes left. Neither of us want to take this because we don't have a good answer. <laughs> um, I mean, I put in the chat that we need more better impact metrics anyway, um, aside, you know, just anyway. <laughs> but um, for me, you know, when you're, when you're trying to assess the impact of the successful impact of a work, it's very hard to do that without keeping in mind what the goals of publishing that work were. And I think right now, especially when you just kind of present numbers to a tenure and promotion committee or something, that's often, those two things are often kind of uh, separated. And so, um, you know, it's, it's hard for me to say like, well, this is the metric that's most important or this is how we should do it because again, you have to be more in tune with what the work is actually trying to accomplish. Um, but I think even just having a sense that, um, you know, downloads don't mean reads and, you know, time on page isn't indicative of reading either. And there, yeah, there, there are a lot, I see I, uh, eye rolls, but, you know, there, there are lots of ways that um, metrics can be gamed and that they're not connected at all to any kind of success. So, um, you know, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm dodging this question because I have more to say around what not to do than, um, than solutions. And I, I, that's my least favorite type of answer. But um, you know, that's kind of, right now on Pop Up, like we, we offer two different types of metrics. We collect lots of others because we just haven't as a group figured out what's right, what's most useful. When we ask researchers, well, like, okay, what are you actually gonna do with this, with this number? They often can't really say that everyone's just used to having what Google spits out at you because it's now be considered standard. And um, you know, there's a line between protecting uh, your. Pr there's a line between giving people information, giving your users and reader and, and authors information, and then also protecting the privacy of your readers. So all of that is in play. It's all stuff that we're weighing. I'm sorry, I'm not giving you a better answer, but it's all stuff that we're really thinking about, and I'm curious to see. What you guys have to say too. Um, I, I want to sneak in with like a 15 second. I think there's a piece in there I want to pick up, Daniela, of like, how do you know if the review you have received is worth paying attention to? And I get just things sparking in my brain. Um, often culture change is a big, big thing. I'm wondering if whether there's some kind of like, as you're reading your review, there's something next to it that says, remember that, you know, just because there might be grammar mistakes or spelling mistakes, that doesn't mean that the review isn't worthwhile because it may be in English as a second language or, or whatever language they're reading in, they may be the second language. Maybe there are other little things like that that you can just prompt that sometimes people need the reminder to think differently about the review that they've received or to think about it in its full context or full potential context. I'm just throwing out that there. And Karen's trying to wrap this up, so I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> Dan wants to say something too. All right, Dan. The, the only thing that I would add to that is I think that what, um, what Catherine's doing and a lot of what we've been talking about here is, is really the seeds toward that. We need an alternative infrastructure. You know, we've, we've for so long been uh, kind of fed a certain amount of metrics or, or certain uh, indicators of quality. And I think what, what you have uh, emerging in the landscape are alternative ways to bring people together uh, and more democratic or more um, equitable um, methods of uh, people pointing to each other and saying, this is great, this is great, you should listen to this. And, and only with those, that infrastructure, I think, do we really have a possibility. So, you know, I think what PubPub's doing is, is a huge deal. And I think what you all are doing at Rebus is, is amazing. So, so thank you, yeah. And thank you again. Yeah, this has been a really, really wonderful exploration of, of how we're all approaching these in very similar, but also, you know, different and contextual ways. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you all. Right.
Thank you. I'm going to run with uh, Dan's uh, metaphor of seeds. As a gardener, I would just like to say that these conversations are the water for those seeds in the landscape. And so thanks to our guests, Dan Rudman, Catherine Ahern, and Zoe Wake Hyde. We're delighted that you could join us today. And thanks to everyone for um, being here. And we hope to see you next month when we talk about classroom review. All right, farewell. Thank you.